Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad you're here. I'm very excited about this sermon series today. We're going to speak uh, in depth about a certain action that we should take. All right, so let's get into the reading of the Word of God. When Saul became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son, Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah, were judges in Beersheba. Samuel was the prophet of God. He's the man of God in the land. And at that time, we have a whole book called the Book of Judges, right? In the Book of Judges, it tells us about all the, the leaders of God's people. And Samson was one of the judges. He wasn't just this big, dumb brute. He was a very smart, intelligent, anointed man of God, chosen to lead and protect them. There were many judges in the land. Some of them were male, some of them were female, but they were the leaders of God's people. They were hearts that were devoted to God. But here's, we had a problem and it was started showing. It was apparent that we had a problem. And the problem was verse number three, his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. <laughs> Today, <clears throat> sorry, I, I just had something in my throat. Uh, you guys, <laughs> we all know about bribes and perverted justice. We see it uh, every time and God hates it. And the man of God's own sons was getting caught up in this type of thing. And that's really terrible. Now the elders gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel. And they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people of Israel in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Okay. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are also doing to you. Now then obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So what happened? They got, they were like, you know what? This is the perfect opportunity for us to ask for a king to be like everyone else all around us. There's a tendency in mankind to always try to be like everyone around us, right? We always try to fit in and keep up with the Joneses. And, and it causes us sometimes when it encounters God's will for our lives, we often go in wrong directions just because we're trying to be like someone else. For hundreds and hundreds of years, the judges were running in, in charge of Israel, but they wanted kings like everyone else, not realizing they already had a king. And who was their king? Jesus. No, Jesus wasn't. <laughs> uh, no. Who was their king? Does anybody know? Who was the king of Israel at that time? During the times of the judges? Nobody knows it? Going once. The answer was God. The answer was God himself. Father God. Father God was their king. He himself was the king of oh, Moses. Moses was saying, hey, he's the king. And... I'm going to interpret his word for you guys, but he's the king. And as long as the, the leader's heart was devoted to God, the king's will would be done. But now the people are seeing, wait, these, these people, I don't know if we trust his sons to be the prophet. Not realizing God could have rose up another prophet. And it didn't necessarily have to be his sons, but this was the opportunity for the people. Give us a king, give us a king, give us a king. And the Lord took it as a personal offense. And God said, it is not me that, uh, it's not you that they're rejected. It's me that they have rejected, okay? They have rejected me from being king. That was verse number seven, okay? No, you're going to give him a warning. So in the following verses, he gives him a warning and tells him all the bad stuff that's going to happen if you have a king. Eventually, this king will have a son, and then his son will be king, and you don't know if he's going to be good or bad. You can choose your first one, but you don't even know if that first one's going to be good. And there's going to be a lot of stuff. He's going to take your daughters to be perfumes, bakers, cooks. He's going to take the best of your land, the best of your fields. He's going to take a tenth of all the grain in the vineyards and give it to his officers and servants. And that's his rights. And he will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys. And he'll make them work. And you will cry out in that day, verse number 18. You will cry out in that day because of your king on whom you... So God's telling him in advance. Okay, all right, you want this? Listen, you can have it, but something... You need to be aware of the consequences. 
Okay, they need to teach this in college because they don't they don't teach they teach everybody to be so aware of their feelings and, and facts don't care about your feelings. And sometimes life is hard. You gotta be aware of the consequences of your decisions now because it's gonna affect you later on, you know. So that's what God is doing here. He's giving them a spiritual spanking. Okay, you want a king? All right, but you need to know this is what's gonna happen. And I may not be able to change your mind if you keep going down that path, but you keep going down that path long enough. And one day you're going to be like, oh, I wish I didn't do this. I wish I didn't. Yeah, you wish. But it's now it's too late. And he says right there in the word. And that day, the Lord will not answer you in that day. Oh, we wish it was like before. No, there's no going back. There's no going back. This is one of those life altering decisions that you can make that will either make you or break you. And it wasn't God's original will that he do, that people made this choice in their life to go down the path of having a king. Just because they wanted to be like everyone else or fall in line with what the crowd is doing, they went down that path and it ultimately ended up destroy, destroying them. If you look on the future, once there was a king that was installed, in the future, the kingdom was later divided. Then they had two kings and sometimes one was bad and the other was good. Or sometimes the, the other was good and the other was bad. And sometimes they were both bad at the same time. And it ultimately led them to a destructive moment. And when the true king arose, which was Jesus, the promised Messiah, when he finally came to the picture, he didn't even wear a crown on the earth. He said, I'm not going to wear a crown here. It's not my time to be glorified here. The Father will glorify me in time. My kingdom is not really of this world at all. My kingdom is the heavenly place, but I am their king. And Pilate knew it, the king of the Jews. Jesus never came with all the same pomp that the worldly kings had. But the Bible tells us this scripture. And who remembers the scripture very well? It says, And God will make all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Let's pull that up real quick. And this is going to be found in Romans 8.28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And if we're called according to his purpose, we know that even if we find ourselves in a mess, God can start rearranging that mess and make it something beautiful, right? And he can take something that even when we don't go the right path of God and we go a different path, God is able to fix the situation somehow, right? And so God's saying, listen, just answer the prayer. They're not doing my will, but I'll still make myself glorified in that situation. Okay? Let's continue. The Lord grants Israel's request. But the few, so Paul, Saul, King, I'm sorry, the Samuel, the prophet Samuel, end up giving the speech and telling the people the good and the bad. And it says this, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel or take Samuel's advice. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and will go out before us and fight our battles. Not realizing the Lord was already the one going out and fighting their battles. And the Lord was going out with splitting the Red Sea. He was going out with sometimes angelic armies. He was going out with pestilence. He was going out with famine. He was going out with with the the insects that would go and drive them out. And the Bible tells us uh, plenty of examples of this. When Samuel heard the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord and said, Lord, this is what the people are saying. And the Lord said to Samuel, Okay, obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of the city, All right, go everybody, go home. Go every man to your city and come back. We're going to, I'll tell you who the king is going to be. All right. Verse number, chapter 12, we're going to skip all the way to chapter number 12. And in chapter number 12, we're going to go to verse number 20. So Samuel said to the people, Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil. It ain't what you're doing. It ain't right asking for a king. You did not, uh, turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great namesake, because it pleased the, the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should cease, I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. My job is to pray for you, Samuel saying. My job is to intercede on your behalf 
even when you're not right, I'm going to be at least devoted to the Lord. I'm going to pray for you. Sometimes parents have to be like that for their own children, right? The children who have gone wayward. You can, as parents, tell them everything you know. But eventually the children's going to be like, no, nope, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to do my own thing. And you got to let them because that's life. And sometimes they're going to go make their own way and they're going to do their own thing. And, and maybe you don't know, maybe it's of the Lord. Sometimes it's not of the Lord. Sometimes it is of the Lord. You, you don't really know. But your job is to give them that advice. And eventually they're going to say, okay, I'm going to go my own way or I'm going to take that advice or not. But your job is still to love them and pray for them, even when they make those bad decisions, right? That goes for our adult children that we have, especially. Moreover, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And I will instruct you in the good and right way. I'm still going to be here offering counsel and advice. This is a great advice for parents of adult children, of teen children. Sometimes they, they want to make their own path and they're not, it's, it's not going through their thick head. That's fine. You can still love them from afar by praying for them. Hallelujah. Verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve Him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things He has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. There was something else that we missed uh, about this part. And I'm going to show you the gravity of the situation. We're going to go back a few scriptures in that very same chapter, in chapter 12. In chapter 12, But this time, we're going to stop at verse number... We're going to give you chapter number 13. Verse number 13. So verse number 13. And I want you to see this part because there's a very great seriousness to this. Chapter 12, verse 13. And now, behold, the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now therefore, stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. It is not wheat harvest today. Is it not time to harvest wheat today? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain and that you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. So basically, it was a clear day and clear skies, and it wasn't the season for a great thunderstorm. But what happened was that the, the, they needed to realize the gravity of the mistake of asking for something that was not in God's will. As believers, we sometimes ask God for things that He doesn't want for our life. When it comes to relationships, we ask people, well, God, I really want to be with that girl. And God's checked your spirit. He checked your spirit. You don't feel peace in your heart at all uh, when you pray. You don't feel peace in your spirit, but you feel the feelings of desire. You want to be with that girl. You want to be with that guy. You feel it, but in your spirit, it doesn't bear witness with your spirit. Your spirit doesn't have any peace about the situation. And when you ask God, you don't feel the peace of the leading of the Holy Spirit. That peace that comes upon you when you're praying. The peace that comes upon you when you're seeking God's face. You know that peace when the Holy Spirit first comes upon you. It's like it goes away. It's it's a quickening of your spirit that something is not right. Something is out of balance. Usually when we start praying, we repent for any sins that we have when you feel that. Because usually it's our heart condemning us. But if it still lingers when you're putting a matter before God, saying, Lord, I want to pray about this. Can I have this? And you don't feel that peace. It's generally God telling you, no. And we can still continue asking and asking. But do you know that sometimes when we ask for things that is not against God's will, and we continue to ask for them, sometimes God will give us what we want. But it wasn't His will. This is a prime example of that. God didn't have it in His heart for the people to do this and ask for a physical king. But He knew that they were going to do it, and they were rebelling ever since Moses' day. They were rebelling and rebelling, and God's fine. You want it? Listen, I didn't create you as a robot. I didn't create you to just do everything I want to do. You have free will. God, one of the God's greatest gifts to us, to mankind, is free will. He lets every person make a choice 
about what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. And we can tell God to shove it. How terrible. How wicked. And now thunder and lightning is coming down from the sky and the people are freaking out because they realized that, that they were asking something outside of God's will and God's saying, okay, fine, you want that, you want that. Our, our Heavenly Father often acts like a real Heavenly Father. And this may be hard for people who didn't grow up with fathers, but sometimes the father's strict. But he's still good. He's still good. He will still let us have, even if it's something that you don't want or that's not going to be good for you. We also know this from the passage of the Bible of the man, of the father who had the two sons. And one said, I want all my inheritance right now. I don't even want to wait till you're dead. I want my money and I want it now. And the father said, okay. And the father let him do it. The other son was like, Phew. I ain't doing that. I'm going to be a good son. And that son went out in his foolishness and lost everything. You know, so we can make those decisions. And that's in the Bible. So we can make those kind of decisions that is hurting God's feelings. Go there. Lord, I'm going to marry that person either way. I don't have her for you. I may have someone else for you. And now I have to hurt that person who I had for you. You're not thinking about that, are you? You're only thinking about yourself. It's okay. You can still have it. Look, this is a tough thing to hear. But this is what's actually happening at this moment for the Israelites. And Saul, Samuel can see it, but the people, they can't see it. All they see is what they want and what they want right now. So, you know, we got to think about sometimes like that, during, especially during Christmas time, right? And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins this evil to ask ourselves a king. Oh, so now they repent. Now they see we should not have a king. And that's where I begin with verse 20. Samuel said, don't be afraid. You have done this evil. But God's saying, look, there can be a balance. If now you and the king, now there's two people. If you and the king, what is it? Both you. So only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what the great things he has done for you. But if you do wickedly, you will be swept away, both you and your king. Okay. So now there's a, a responsibility that has to happen. And that is when you make a decision that is against God's will, it's a tight rope. And that rope may be cut. And as we're going to see in this passage, as we're going through Saul's, Saul today, you're going to see that it's a fine rope. There's not much leeway. It's almost, and I don't want to say it like this, but in some ways it's close to this. Okay, what I'm going to say, it is not of God, not of, not, I'm going to say it's not the Lord, but it's close to us. It's God's waiting for you. It's, I want to say the enemy's waiting for you to fail or even God's waiting for you to fail. Or God's just standing at the, at the, at the road waiting for you to, to turn back. And, and the, I wouldn't say that if that was, wasn't the case with the prodigal son. The prodigal son said, I want my inheritance. The father knew he was making a bad decision. Where was the father in that whole situation? Does everybody remember where the father was? Yeah, the prodigal son who ran away to squander his father's wealth, the one I mentioned in the example just a little while ago. Does anybody remember where the father, who represents Father God, was? There's a reason I'm saying this. Where was he in the story during the time that the son squandered the wealth? Who remembers? Go ahead and unmute if you know the answer. Nobody? Was he sick? No, the father wasn't sick. He was just waiting he was waiting for his son on the edge. He was looking out for his son to finally come to his senses and come home. Maybe it's not that he's waiting for you to fail. That's not the right words. That's what I'm trying to explain. But he's, he's like out the outskirts waiting to catch you because he almost knows you're making a bad decision. I think that's a mark of a good father. I think we would be wise if we tell our son, hey, come down from there. And he's not, he still climbs the tree. Wouldn't a wise father be there? Not that we want our son to fail. But we have to be there as a responsibility just to catch them. I think Saul feels the gravity of that in this passage because he says in the next few pa uh, pa passages, he says, I would be sinning against the Lord if I sought to pray, if I stopped praying for you. He's saying, I would be sinning if I wanted just was like, okay, fine, fail. And God's saying, no, you need to pray for them even if they're making a bad decision. So the actual character of God is not that he wants you to fail, but he's standing at the border because he almost knows what's going to happen, so to speak. And Samuel, the man of God, also feels the same. He's, I better pray for you and I'm going to still serve the Lord 
by giving you good advice. He said, I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only fear the Lord. He said, I'm not going to stop praying for you, and I'm not going to stop giving you good advice. And I think as a parent, people who are estranged from your children, if I think it's not good. I think you should still be in their lives, even if they're not taking your advice and they're rejecting you. And I think you need to still pray for them and you still need to love them, even if from afar and you still are there with open arms to catch them. I don't think it's right for us to have the attitude that says, ah, I told you, because the father in the prodigal son example did not have that attitude. He didn't have the attitude to say, you shouldn't have gone out there. No, he was there with the covering. The, the moment he came through, he the, the, the son was like, I sinned, father, I sinned. And the father's like, stand up. Here, let me cover you. Here, kill the, let's have a party. Let's kill the fat steak burger cow today. We're going to have big steaks and burgers, right? And the, it just made the other brother, the good brother, jealous. But it was in the character of the father to catch us. So I hope that clarifies that part. Now, we're going to go to chapter 13. I don't know who that was for, but that might be for somebody. If you're watching this, I know we're going into territory, but I'm really glad to share this in depth. I won't go over uh, all the parts of it, but there was a king that was chosen. And the king that was chosen was a man named Saul. Okay, And Saul was the king that was chosen by the people. And again, I won't show all all that was the story and how he became the king. But basically, Samuel said, okay, I'll find you a king. And the king that God chose was a man named Saul. Saul was a tall, a head taller than almost every person. He was really tall. He was about as tall as emperor, probably. Emperor's not here. But emperor, if you're watching, you look like a king. Now, so Saul is here and he's the one that the people want. He looks like a king. He looks like the part. He's got one major problem, and we're going to find out what it is in just a few moments. So Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were in Saul, uh, were with Saul in Michmash and the hill country of Bethel. And, three, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. Jonathan is the prince. The king's son, so now the son Jonathan is a prince. In my opinion, Jonathan is a great guy. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Gibeah, and the Philistines heard of it. So Saul blew, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let all the Hebrews hear. And so all Israel heard it, and it was said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines. It also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. And all the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. Gilgal. So no, now it's really, even though it's really Jonathan that, that, that had the victory, the dad wants the credit. And so now it's everybody's, yeah, the king did it, the king did it. Now, there, by the way, there's not really weapons in their army. There's, they're really, they're, there's no really weapons because they've been in te- a Philistine control for a long time. And now they elected themselves a king. And they're thinking that's just going to help them fight against uh, the Philistines. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Avon. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes, and in rocks, and in tombs, and in... Man, they're even hiding in the tombs, and in cisterns. They're hiding in water jars. The, some e- e- Hebrews crossed the fords. They crossed the water o- uh, over the Jordan to the land of Gad, which was one of the tribes far farthest away. They're like, I'm getting as far away in safe territory as possible. And in Galilee, uh, or Gilead, Saul was at Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling and all the people followed him trembling so they're like we're still going to be with you king but we're ah, they can't even no peace no peace so now what what's happening they're on a stage where they need a christmas miracle okay they need the the they need something because they poked the bear and the bear was like that's it we're gonna annihilate you guys and they show up with this vast army normally the israelites were giving tribute to the Philistines, they were, it wasn't as bad as the situation, but they really poked the bear this time. 
And now uh, Saul, who blew the trumpet and says, hey, tell him I did it. Tell him I did it. And now it's backfiring on him because they're like, Who's, who did it? And everybody's like, it was him. And he's like, he can't blame it on his son. <laughs> he takes full credit and also full responsibility. And so the army is camped up against him. He has an instruction because he needs something that only the Lord can give. And the blessing of the Lord would be with him as long as he followed God and God's instruction. And there's a separation between the priesthood and there's a separation between the kingship. And some of this is laid out in Leviticus when it's talked about the duties of the priest. And some of it's laid out in Samuel when it comes to the duties of the king. But there's a separation between church and state. There's a separation between the, the, the priesthood and the kingship. Keep that in mind. This is going to be important in just a few moments. Check this out. Seven days... He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. Who is Samuel? The man of God. Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. Saul said, Bring me the burnt offering here to me, and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Now, what was happening? They had everything ready to go. Because the man of God said, I'm going to be coming After seven days. After seven days, I'm going to show up. So the people are like, all right. The king is not authorized by God to go out of his way to offer sacrifices. That's not the job of the king. The king has to do with more direct rule, has to do with money, has to do with the everyday life, the the ruling of the kingdom. And the man of God is supposed to be the one that's intercessing on behalf of God. This man of God is the one who is the high priest and only the sons of Aaron, according to the book of Leviticus, are authorized to offer these sacrifices before the Lord. They can offer them in the Holy of Holies. They can offer them in the the tent of meeting in the temple before the temple was built in the, the tent of meeting. And they can offer God the sacrifices using the Ark of the Covenant. They are authorized by God because they're part of the priesthood. They're the chosen to be the priest. They're the authorized man or woman of God. They have anointing. And the king thought just because he wears a crown, he's equal to that. See, money doesn't equal spirituality. A nice suit doesn't equal anything. It doesn't mean that I'm holy because I carry a Bible. And it doesn't mean you're holy or you're authorized because you're a billionaire. It just means you have money and you have power in this physical world when it comes to physical things. But it does not equal spirituality. The king made a big foolish mistake by assuming that he was at this grand time and season of his life that he is on par and able to make God happy by doing something outside of his lane. And here's what happened. He said, bring me the offerings, the burnt offerings. This was Samuel's offering. They had it ready to go for Samuel, the man of God, not Saul, the king. King. As soon as he saw, uh, as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel came. As soon as he lights up the fire and it's done, the man of God shows up. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. And he said, hey, hey, uh, good, good to see you. All right. Saul went out and Saul said, when I saw that the people were, uh, and this is what Samuel says, what have you done? What have you done? You're in trouble now. Yeah. See, I'm I'm sorry, this message is strict, right? This this message is strict because sometimes God is strict. I'm sorry. That's how it is. What have you done? And then Saul makes the excuse. When I saw the people were scattering from me, and they didn't come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Mixmash. And I said, now that the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord, so I forced myself to offer the burnt offering. Oh, you forced yourself. And Saul... Said to, uh, Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command, the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom of Israel over Israel forever. But now your kingdom will not continue. 
He's only been in office two years. He's only been in office two years and he screws up really bad. And the word of the Lord to him is now your kingdom will not be established. It was going to be established forever. It would have been in your lineage. The Messiah would come out of your lineage. But now, no. Now your kingdom shall not continue. And the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord's already looking for someone else. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal. And the rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah and Benjamin. Now we'll stop there. And we're going to talk about this. By the way, little Bible trivia. Who was the man uh, whom God sought to replace Samuel with? David. That's right, Christina Kelly, our resident Bible scholar. She knows it. She's a pro. It is David. God was already looking for some a replacement once he failed the test. Okay? That's not good, right? But eh, it's God. It's and He's always good. But it wouldn't seem good to us. And what happened because of that? What ended up happening is Saul lived in paranoia. King Saul lived in paranoia for the next number of years. I think it was like a number 20, maybe even 40 years. I, I think it's uh, 20 years that he was still in office, just paranoid that, that this person would arise and he didn't know who it was. And when he finally suspected and realized it was David and there was nothing he could do, he tried to kill David. See, there was a lot of bad things that all started from this one moment of time. Now, what is our sermon really all about? I'm grateful to lay a foundation about Saul. It's important. We see it. But the sermon series we've been preaching is Windows, Observation, Observance, and Actions. And today, there was a very important action that Saul could have taken. That, le- that would have changed the course of his destiny. What was that action? And then we're going to talk about what it is that caused him to miss that action. Because he didn't realize that window of time for him was seven days. It says right there in the word that he did not come at the appointed time. But if that was really true, it says as soon as... He said he waited seven days. It didn't say he waited eight days. It said he waited seven days. The time appointed by Samuel. The man of God said, Hey, I'll be here in seven days. But when seven days passed, Samuel did not come and the people were scattering. He said, Bring me here. So at the very end of that seventh day, probably sundown of the seventh day, he offers it. And as soon as he offers it, something happens. So between the seventh and the eighth day, something happened. Saul offered the sacrifice and the man of God showed up immediately after it. It's not a it's not an all day thing to light a fire. So somebody tell me what was the action that Saul took or what was the action that he did not take? Does anybody know what this action and it's almost a trick question. Yeah. What was the what was his action? Because he didn't realize the window of time for his seven days. What action would have changed his course of his destiny? Reflection time. Repentance. Repentance. It could have been close. No. Not exactly. You're close. He should have waited. He shouldn't have, like you said, he shouldn't have gotten out of his lane. He should have waited. That's right. That's the, that is correct. That's the answer. That, that, uh, that's one of the answers I'll accept. There was an answer in the chat that says, consult the Lord first before making the decision. He was trying to consult the Lord by doing the sacrifice. He wanted to seek the favor of God. Lord, I need your help. So he was consulting him, but in an unauthorized way. He already had the word of the Lord. What was the Lord of the word of the Lord for him? Does anybody know what the word of the Lord was? And the action was wait. So we'll get back to this in just a second. But what was the word of the Lord he had already received? Does anybody know what it might have been? Because he already knew what God already told him. This is important. Okay, Think about the seven days. What was the word of the Lord that he already got? Not following? Okay, not following the instructions. No. What was the word of the Lord? The answer is, the time, it's found in verse number six. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. Who is Samuel? Again, Samuel, the man of God. 
the man of God said, wait seven days. Okay, that was the word of the Lord. Okay, the, the word of the Lord was given straight from the, the prophet man of God, the, the judge of Israel. He said, I'll be here in seven days. Meet me there at seven days. Wait. Instead, something happened to Saul that caused that king to King Saul that caused him to mess up. And it was the same sin. Sorry. It was the same sin that everyone messed up in the beginning with. Do you guys remember what the big sin was? The people wanted a king because they said what? That's right, Claudia. You got it. Somebody tell me the answer. The people said, we want a king because we want to fill in the blank. What is the answer? Be like, be like the other nations. That's right. Okay. So they're so concerned with what everybody thinks about them that it causes them to err. Now, what sin did King Saul do during these seven days? Really, that caused him to sin at the end of the seventh day. But what was it that caused him? Somebody tell me. Why didn't he wait? He became impatient. Okay, and why did he become impatient? And that's correct, but why? It could be linked to pride. Anyone else? He trusted in himself. Let me reverse the scriptures and see if this gives you any clue. The men of Michmash followed him trembling. It tells us that people hid themselves in caves, in tombs, in rocks, in holes, whatever they can find. They're hiding themselves, and people are really afraid. Does that tell us now a big clue about what was going on in Saul that caused King Saul that caused him to sin in this way? It's not exactly pride, although it could be part of it. Anybody want to take a gander? Okay. The answer is exactly the same thing that the people of Israel sinned. They wanted to be like everyone else. So they're so concerned with what other people think. And the king was also concerned with what everyone was thinking and feeling and going on rather than following the steps of the Lord that were already living, given to him. Think about how you might feel in this example. You look around and everybody's hiding in caves and everybody's freaking out and every, people are leaving you left and right and some people are abandoning ship and they're like, oh, and you're the captain of the ship and you're here and you're, you have to hold your guns. You, you're the leader and all your people left you. It is so easy to be tempted, the higher you go in status and money and everything, to be steered by the will of the people rather than the will of God. And that's an ultimate test. That's actually the test for Samuel. I'm sorry, that's the test for Saul. That's the test for Saul. Because there comes a point in time when are you going to follow what other people want you to do? Or are you going to follow what actually God is leading you for your life, your mission, your purpose? As a pastor or as a pastor or a leader, a minister of any kind within the body of Christ, there's a the big temptation for pastors to start leading their church instead of the leading of the Holy Spirit and to have their churches led by the Holy Spirit, they elect rather to be led by the will of the pastor. Rather, I'm sorry, as the will of the people. So the pastor will start, I don't want to offend these people, so I'm not going to preach about that. Even though God's saying, hey, you need to preach about this. I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to preach about money because there's people, they have a lot of money right now. Or I don't want to preach about sin because I don't want that person to sin because I happen to know that they, they have this sin and I don't want to talk about that. Or, and so there's this temptation and it's very prominent in Western churches where a church will be guided by the will of the people. Now, I'm not just making this up. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelations this. Let's pull up the scripture. It's going to be found in 2 Timothy chapter uh, verses 3 to 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Another version would say they give them itching. They would give themselves leaders and teachers who will tell them what their itching ears wish to say. So that's basically what they're doing. A time is coming when people will gather themselves, only people who give them what their itching ears want to say. And even whether it's right or wrong, 
I mean, well, not even if it's right, mostly because it's wrong, they will do this kind of stuff. That's the will of people. So there's a test that leaders go through. Are you going to be driven by peer pressure? Are you going to be driven by popularity? Are you going to be led by the Holy Spirit? It's not always easy to make a stand for the Lord at Thanksgiving when you're surrounded by people who don't agree with you. It's not always easy to be true to the Lord and true to, I I, got to be careful saying this, true to yourself because you could be wrong, right? We could always be wrong. But true to the Lord in the midst of a great pressure that we are under. I don't fault him for being under pressure and I don't fault the people for hiding because it's scary. Who can blame them? If you're, you got to think about your children, right? I can't live here. I, I'm out of here. My king wants to make a bad decision. If they want to go to war, I don't. I, I won't fault you for that. Okay. Some people have it in them to be brave, and some people maybe they just don't come from that. But the king was different. The king was chosen to be brave. The king needs to either die with the ship. He needs to make a stand for the Lord, and he's going to serve the Lord to death. And that's how it's got to be. Don't they always say that the captain goes down with the ship? Okay. Now, I'm not sure if that's right or wrong, but that's the saying. When it comes to kingship, if he's the king, he needs to be willing to follow God all the way through, even if it's to the fire, to the furnace, or to the cross. Because the Lord tells us, take up your cross and follow me. God doesn't offer us an easy life that's only easy and avoiding hard times, struggles. That's what's, those are those moments, those are those windows that make you or break you. When you can stand for your faith, no matter what. My mom once told me as a young boy, she said, son, if they are pulling out my fingernails, as a young boy, she told me this, if they're pulling out my fingernails and they tell you, take the mark of the beast, you need to let me scream. You need to let me be tortured and you need to let me die. Because I cannot guarantee your salvation. I can't make you go to heaven. But I will tell you the truth. And this is what my mom said to me. The Bible says, He who denies me before men, I will deny them before my Father in heaven. If you, and then she said, If you love me more than you love Jesus, your priorities are wrong. You're in the wrong place. You need to love Jesus more than anything. Fear not. Jesus says, Fear not what man can do to the body. Fear what God can do to you for he can cast the body and soul into hellfire and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul but rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell i tell you my friends this is what jesus said do not fear those who can kill the body and after that have nothing more they can do to you but i warn you to whom to fear fear him whom after he has killed he has the authority to cast in hell yes i tell you fear him and who is that God, our Heavenly Father, you could say, Jesus, only God has the power to throw us in hell of fire. You need to make the stand for Christ, regardless of the pressure. Je- Peter was under that great pressure. They were like, he was watching Jesus be assaulted, have his beard ripped out, punched, abused, put the crown of thorns, lashed. And Peter was following from behind. And when they said, hey, aren't you and him together? He said, no, I don't know him. And he denied him before men. My friends, if it comes to that type of thing, and they ask us, take the mark, because you love bread more than Jesus. You're with, you love food more than Jesus. You love yourself more than you love Jesus. And you'll take that mark of the beast, or you will deny Jesus. You will swear your allegiance to the Antichrist. That's a time that can come. The Bible speaks about those kinds of things. We have to be aware that we have to make a decision, whether it's in our lifetime or not. In our lifetime, we have to do what Saul did it. And that's why we have to make a choice to stand and obey the word and command of God. If you don't know what the command of God is, continue reading your Bible and you will discern the will of God. Now, as we read this story and as we go back into our, as we finish up here, we can, verse 13, I won't go into 14. As we finish up here, we can see that the kingdom was taken away from him. And I heard one minister say it best. He said, God is the only one who will let you continue working a job after he fired you. He's the only boss in the world who will do such a thing. It was God himself that removed it from him. 
because his window and his action was no action. His window and his action was simply be still. His action and his window that lasted seven days, which would have made or break him. The man of God was on his way. God sometimes already answered our prayer. And all we have to do is just stand in our faith. Sometimes when it's come to prophetic crypto or something like that or a wealth transfer, sometimes we can't be all anxious about everything we see, especially if you're not experienced in doing that type of thing. Sometimes you just need to stand and be still. But when we see everything around us, we move. And sometimes we just have to be still. That's just the, the reality of it. Sometimes, well, Lord, everyone else is getting married around me. And maybe yours is just around the corner. I don't know. You have to listen to the Lord for that. Because sometimes the Lord is telling you, hey, get yourself out there. <laughs> Take a step. Sometimes the Lord hasn't told you one thing or another. But if the Lord specifically told you to wait, then something. We can be sidetracked by all of our anxiousness. See, anxieties build when we're so looking at what everyone else is around him. Oh my gosh, my people are leaving me. Oh, everybody's hurting. Oh, oh, okay, I'll do something. I'll make it. Because people are saying, hey, do something, do something. And you don't realize that sometimes just sitting there is doing something. Did you not remember the time when Jesus was sleeping in the boat? He was doing something. He was waiting on the will of God. Because he said at the beginning, let's go to the other side. And when he spoke it, guess what? They were going to go to the other side. He went to sleep. But they woke him up saying, Don't you care that we're dying? Don't you care that we're dying? And God, if I was Jesus, I would have said this. Didn't I say we're going to the other side? Do you think that the Father will let any hair of your head die and perish just because of some winds and waves? I'm not saying there's not going to be winds and waves. And I'm not going to say people are not going to abandon you. And I'm not going to say it's not scary. It's very scary to follow God. It's very scary to stay in His will. You're not exempt from that. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's hard. But sometimes your action is no action. Maybe they would have been like, oh, if Jesus is sleeping, maybe I should sleep too. Because maybe it's my moment to rest. In music, I put it here in my notes here, that in music, there is a very important thing. And it's called the rest. You cannot just fill your noise with sounds. I'm listening to studies from some top, some of the top industry producers of, of some of the best dance music around. And as I listen to some of them, there's a high critique of current music that all the music is filled with so much sound that the audience doesn't even know really what to listen to. And they're filling this their tracks with so many tracks and so many players that not realizing that when one player plays, another pr player has to decrease. And so there's so much sound that it's like sensory overload. And we can't just enjoy the beauty of the moment. There's no rest in the music. That rest is really important. In fact, that rest even comes important when it comes to dance music, especially. Right before the, the big drop happens, there's a taking away. Do you know most of the drums go away? The bass goes away? They decrease the sounds of the bass right before that. If it's a dubstep or even if it's just big music, there's that pause before the singer comes in with the note right before the chorus. It is a beautiful thing. To not do anything. I'm going to say that again. It is a beautiful thing. And it's scientifically designed in music. In everything to have a rest. The, the flowers, they grow. It's not just sunlight. There's sunlight and then there is a closure. And the leaves and the plants, what do they do when the sunlight goes away? They close. And they protect themselves. And they rest. And they relax. And they recharge. Think about Sabbath. Six days shall you labor. One day you shall rest. That was, Jesus said the Sabbath was not, not designed, man was not designed for Sabbath, but Sabbath was designed for man. And that Jesus is the Lord of Sabbath. The whole purpose of Sabbath is so that you can rest and recover. There is an importance in not doing anything sometimes. And that's a crazy thing to say. But if we keep that in mind, we would have saw that the Israelites also had the same window. They were also being tested. It's a time of testing when you look out and everybody's got what you want, but you don't have it. Their rest was, their action, the Israelites was no action. They should have said, you know what? You're right, Saul. Sorry, you're right, man of God, Samuel. God is our king. We won't ask for king. Forgive us. We will repent. And then the Israelites said, we don't need a king, physical king. We have our heavenly father. He's been our king all along. He's been our king since he parted the Red Sea. He's our king. We'll praise you, Father God. 
And then to this very day, the nations of Israel would have a miracle, wonder-working God. But they lost it because they changed it for an earthly idol, an earthly representation of that, a physical king. And God's okay, you want to you wanna downgrade? All right, I'll let you downgrade. If you want, I'll let you. And they did. See, they all made the same mistake. They didn't understand the window and the season they were in was a season of no action. They would have succeeded. And Sam, King Saul, would have also succeeded by simply resting. No action. Patience. Wait. You already know what to do. You just wait. He said, hey, I'm going to come after seven days. Stop. If it means close your eyes to all that's going on around you, if that means turn off the TV, it means turn off the YouTube, if it means turn off the news, and just wait, hey, you'll have a lot more peace. Some of us are actually following way too close. I'm just going to say it. I don't know who you are, but some of you follow way too close. And some of you just need to just take your hands and just say, okay. And it's great when you can ride, right? Especially in the markets or something like that. But sometimes simple actions, one here or there, is the better, is the best. Some of you just need to simply pray, Lord, am I in position? If not, let me do what's in position. And you don't need to do everything. That's not for everyone to do. Some people are just going to buy dinar and hold on for when it comes to reevaluation or something like that. They're going to buy gold or silver. Some people have heard only buy gold or silver. It moves slower and there should be another one more dip in gold eventually, but then there's going to be a rise. And some people will do good when it comes to those types of things, I believe. Some people are just going to buy things like XRP and, and watch in the future. And some people are going to be so distracted by all the stuff happening that we may move out of position. I want you guys to, to not be moved by greed. And I don't want you guys to be moved by anxiety. I don't want you to be moved by all the, the people around you who are getting what you want. Some of them may do really good. I saw we were laughing because we saw one guy hit in his account $222 million in just a few seconds. My first reaction was, good job. It wasn't, let me try and chase you and do that or follow you. It was, good job, somebody's doing it. Now, it lasted for a moment because it was just a glitch. But the fact is, that's the type of thing that will happen during those type of glitch and hack events. We see those prophetically in the prophetic community. Many of you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you do not, and that's okay. We see that when somebody is getting around what you want, there's sometimes an anxiousness that builds in somebody's heart. Oh, I better, I better, I better do this. I better, better. You need to pray and consult the Lord if you should move. Because maybe you are already just in position. Wealth transfer, and I'm saying this because a lot of people in our community sometimes follow us because they're aware of wealth transfer events. So I do have to talk about this. Some people are already in position, but wealth transfer is going to look different from a lot, for a lots of different people. Some of it, it's one thing, and some people, it's another thing. So don't expect your wealth transfer to look like everyone else's wealth transfer. Some of it may be bank driven for some of you guys who know what's happening with the banks. And some of it's going to be currency driven and some of it's going to be uh, market driven in lots of different ways. There's lots of ways that it can happen. You just need to seek the Lord and have the peace. And once you have the peace, ride on and follow his instructions. Sometimes it is a physical instruction and sometimes you have to do two or three or ten different things. But I want you to have peace, my friends. Don't be like Saul. All right? Do you understand? I love this message, and I'm glad you guys were here with it. I only have one more sermon in the series. I'm going to preach it next Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Word Room. And we're going to be talking about the wedding feast and the virgins. And it's going to be Windows, Observance, and Actions, part number four. Thank you. By the way, if you guys are watching tomorrow, if you are a dive tier member on our website, patreon.com slash jsong underscore seven, the website's right there in the bottom. We are going to have a time in the markets. We'll be looking at all the cryptos that you guys want us to look at. We did have some big moves on Luna Classic. The trade and close on that four and 12 hour chart was exactly where it should be. And it went right up to its target over today's date. So if you guys are watching it, the breakout was yesterday for that Luna Classic chart map. It's on our website and I checked it today. So it hit its target. So I hope you're doing well with Luna. There is some prophetic word that Luna is going to hit a little bit higher than I expected. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow. And there's some coins. There's a dream that somebody showed me uh, a while back of a number that Christopher Harris shared uh, a while ago. And that was when Bitcoin was at 38 and Luna Classic was at 0 
17. So the time when 38 and 17, when they were together, that's the time when Luna Classic is supposed to move. That was yesterday. Bitcoin was around 38 and Luna Classic was at 17. And that seemed to be a marker. Now, the, the crazy thing about this is that Bitcoin, Luna Classic hit its second target. There's a higher target. There's another target number three on Luna Classic. But I'm very interested that there may be much more on the table to that's going to match prophetic markers because the time when those two prices are exactly the same. By the way, thank you, Superfood. Bitcoin did touch 40,000 today. We did have a $40,000 target on Bitcoin for, for a number of weeks now. But what I'm saying, what I'm saying is when people who are following prophetic markers, if you see two prophetic markers meet at the exact same time, it's generally important. So I think that it's not just a matter of Luna Classic hitting 17 and it's not a matter of Bitcoin hitting 38. I think it's a matter of them hitting at the same time to mark something that was going to happen. A dream that somebody had recently was or that same dream was a woman approached the man and, and the man said she was like saying, what's going on? And he said, if you want to make a lot of money buy Luna Classic now. That was yesterday and the first run up already started. So Luna Classic's higher than that. I think there's going to be another pullback after the targets hit. I think the target was uh, or maybe hit right now during today. So I'm not telling you guys to do any trading, but we're going to look at it again tomorrow to see if there's any other entries and where to look for us. And we're going to talk about those new targets. Everything in this video is not financial investment or trading advice of any kind. Everything's just for entertainment, educational and comedic purposes only. Bear in mind that I eat red crayons for breakfast. And so should you. However, this is not medical or nutritional advice of any kind as well. Trading the markets carries substantial risk. Never trade more than you can afford to lose and especially be aware against high leverage trading. So I wanted to share that with you guys. And we'll be back tomorrow, 9 a.m. And then at the end of our crypto class, we have Bible studies every time. So if you like this content, don't forget to join us or visit us on the website. We love you guys and we'll see you tomorrow.